Hello everyone, this is Alan Gotcher, your host of True Crime, Man's Dark Imagination. Welcome to another episode, our final episode of 2021. I'd like to send out a special thank you to those who were very sympathetic when my brother and my sister-in-law passed away. It was especially hard for me because he was my only sibling. And I'd also like to thank those who contributed to the GoFundMe campaign for my nephews, that those funds will come in handy. And I don't want you to forget that yours truly is the author of these works regarding true crime, Dark Bayou, Infamous Louisiana Homicides, and Bloodstained Louisiana, 12 Homicide Cases. Now let's begin with our episode. On this channel, True Crime Man's Dark Imagination, we've tried to cover the supernatural as well as the factual when it came to documenting those who consume the blood of the living. With this present episode, we will present three stories that investigate the human obsession, whether through mental illness or religious belief, with the properties of the human life force. It seems that throughout the course of human history, the properties of human blood have always held a fascination as to the true meaning of the liquid. Of course, it has always been common knowledge that if one loses too much blood, they will certainly expire. Blood is also the common theme in many religions where it is used as a symbolism for most Christians. In Jewish and Islamic tradition, by comparison, the drinking of blood was absolutely forbidden along with the eating of meat without the blood being drained off. But then again, in recent years, in fact, over the last 200, the flood of vampire lore makes possible the crossover from fiction to fact. In recent episodes of True Crime Man's Dark Imagination, this channel concentrated on not only the legends involved with vampirism, but also we have documented some cases where mortal individuals believe themselves to be the undead and murdered for the sake of their own survival. This is where we continue with the present episode, discovering further cases from throughout the world. Blood was certainly believed to be the life, especially when it came to any religious beliefs. In one of these instances, a religious sect emerged that proved not only controversial, but mysterious as well. On January 27, 1890, the Philadelphia Inquirer produced an article with the headline, They Drink Blood horrible rites practiced by a religious settlement near Kansas City. The article stipulated that officers from the Humane Society and the local police engaged in an investigation of a religious sect in their area. The Samaritans believed in healing the sick and using whatever human production to that end. A year prior to the rise of this sect, they appeared in Blue River, just east of Kansas City, and appeared to be a peace-loving and nonviolent people. The leader of the sect, Silas Wilcox, preached about helping the sick and before long he found a great number of people to join his group. According to the newspaper article, Wilcox eventually convinced his followers that the ingestion of blood would help the sick to heal as well. Surprisingly, the followers went along with this mischaracterization of religious scriptures. The reasoning behind Wilcox's reliance on blood to help the sick occurred as he, himself, lay deathly ill. One of his followers, a Nancy Dixon, believed fervently in the doctrine Wilcox professed, that she bore her arm to the preacher and then penetrated one of the many veins in her exposed arm. Wilcox placed his mouth over the wound and began suckling the wound. After a few minutes, Wilcox laid back and let out a satisfying sigh. According to the news reports of the day, the following morning, Wilcox appeared cured of whatever ailment incapacitated him. Those who witnessed Wilcox's recovery stood firm on the belief that the blood was the life. From that moment forward, Wilcox professed his recovery as the proof of his theories. Church membership grew steadily, but the blood supply had to be steadied 
in order to make sure that the continued proof would be sustained. Although religious cults of the day operated with the stipulation that they did not cause harm to other people around them, police were suspicious of the Samaritans after visiting the home of one of Wilcox's followers. When authorities arrived at the Wrinkle home, they found the father of two laying on his bed in the last stages of consumption, or tuberculosis, a bacterial disease that ran rampant in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Also in the residence were two children that appeared emaciated, Upon closer examination, authorities found wounds covering the bodies of the children, sores that appeared to not heal right away. Clearly, the wounds were there as a result of the children being bled. In January of 1890, someone composed a letter to the secretary of the Kansas City Humane Society, a Mr. Huckett, and related a most unusual incident that the author of the letter referenced. There's some that I think that ought to be called to your attention at once, which I think is bad for a civilized community. There is John Wrinkle and his two children. He has been sick and he is crazy with religion. His little girl, Minnie, is 13 years old and his boy, John, is 11. Wrinkle has heard of people drinking blood at slaughterhouses and he said that he believed in the Bible that it preached that the well should be sacrificed for the sick. He did bleed the little girl and boy until they are wrecks and he did drink blood. It has leaked out and unless something is done by you, the neighbors will take things into their own hands and that quick too. He lives on a little piece of land near the city limits. Yours respectfully, George West. P.S. Send some offices. When confronted with the accusation that he bled his children to save himself, Wrinkle readily admitted that he availed himself of the opportunity and asserted that the children gave their blood voluntarily to restore him to health. The man could not be moved, but authorities later placed the children within a home. After further investigation, law enforcement discovered that the Samaritans' blood drinking first began when they frequently visited slaughterhouses in the area, procuring the blood they believed they needed. Then the sect acquired their own animals and began bleeding them to satisfy their quest for healing. After this seemed to be less than fruitful, it appeared that the true believers began feasting on the blood from amongst themselves. This entailed meeting at a member's house and then indulging in the practice of bloodletting. According to one account, the sick or ailing members ask for assistance from the well ones and these are detailed to give their blood according to their health and strength. When a member becomes very sick, the ones take turns in supplying him or her the life-giving fluid. Once the practice was discovered and reported to authorities by locals, Wilcox insisted that the Samaritans did nothing wrong and no law existed that prevented the practice as long as the blood were given voluntarily. The Samaritans, as it turned out, were not the only ones who drank blood. Slaughterhouses across the country accommodated people who wanted to drink animal blood. With the rising rate of poverty, most of the less fortunate drank blood to supplement any diet they may or may not have at the time. These may not have been related to the Samaritans per se, but it seemed that many believed at the time that the blood was the life. Indeed, the poor certainly believed it. After receiving the letter, Huckett passed the correspondence along to the Kansas City Police Chief. The Chief then dispatched an officer to investigate, and according to the news, the officer then reported that the letter did not do the scene justice. The officer noted how pale the children appeared and noted the scars found on their arms. To this day, there is no documentation as to what occurred with the Samaritans. It can only be surmised that Wrinkle died from tuberculosis and his children were therefore made wards of the state. Additionally, no newspaper stories appeared that determined the disposition of the cult or Wilcox. It appeared that they just disappeared. In 1932, Lily Lindstrom, a 32-year-old prostitute, lived in an apartment complex of a neighborhood now known as Vasistan. Lindstrom basically lived in luxury compared to her neighbors as she was one of the few people at the time that actually owned a telephone. 
Lindstrom used the device to gain clientele as she made good money with her chosen profession. Lindstrom used her flat in order to entertain those guests, and entertaining seemed very profitable. One such call would prove to be deadlier than all others and remains a mystery to this day. In May of 1932, on what Norwegians referred to as Walpurgis Night, Lindstrom paid a visit to a neighbor who lived in a flat downstairs from her own, a friend named Minnie Jansen, because she needed some condoms, because she soon expected a client to arrive. Lindstrom did this often as she seemed unprepared on many occasions for receiving clients and called on Jansen for the prophylactics. Also, Lindstrom would visit her neighbor with nothing on but an overcoat. When the two inadvertently returned to Lindstrom's apartment, the phone rang. Lindstrom answered and Jansen moved closer to the phone to hear the conversation. Is this Miss Lindstrom? The voice asked. Lindstrom replied that this is whom the man was speaking with on the telephone. Are you home if I come visit? asked the stranger. Of course I am home. You can hear that, Lindstrom giggled. Can you receive me if I come in a while? Yes. Are you far away? Lindstrom queried. No, I am very close. I'll be here soon, the man replied, and then hung up. Jansen and Lindstrom sat up and talked for a little while that evening and spoke about what they would wear that evening when they went out on the town. On the following day, when Jansen had yet to see her friendly neighbor, it did not prove to be alarming. As one day turned into another, several loud knocks at Lindstrom's door produced no answer. As Jansen continued her attempts to reach Lindstrom failed, she then notified the police. Authorities arrived at Lindstrom's door on the morning of May 4, 1932, three days after she had last been seen. When they first opened the door, authorities noticed nothing out of order. After searching the whole apartment, they finally arrived at the bedroom. Laying on the bed, naked, was Lily Lundstrom, her clothes folded neatly on a chair next to her. Her head appeared to have been badly beaten in, and the coroner later determined her death as a result of a blunt force beating. An investigator surmised that the murder weapon could possibly have been a crowbar or pipe, but no weapon was found near the scene. Additionally, Lindstrom proved to be in the midst of a sexual act as there appeared to be a condom lodged within her anus. But this did not prove to be the only shocking thing the authorities noted at the scene. As police inspected the body, they noted that Lindstrom's corpse had been entirely drained of all blood. More suspiciously, authorities noticed no blood spatter anywhere in the apartment itself. Investigators found no visible means as to how this corpse could have been drained of every single drop of blood or how someone or something could have carried so much blood away from the scene. One clue was a bloody ladle found nearby. It appeared to the police that they may have been dealing with someone who drank all of the victim's blood with that ladle. Nothing appeared stolen from the apartment, and the killer left the abode in a nearly immaculate state. This killer seemed different as to deliver a vicious beating and then neatly fold the victim's clothing on the bed. When the media discovered the gruesome details of the crime, they dubbed the killer the Atlas Vampire where one year earlier Todd Browning's production of Dracula, starring Hungarian actor Bela Lugosi, had been released. Perhaps the media desired to dovetail with that production and came up with the moniker. Authorities realized they had to find a suspect very quickly, but the killer left very little evidence for the investigators to process. Later, when authorities interrogated Jansen regarding her neighbor, she described the conversation but could not identify the man's voice. Although there was plenty of bodily fluids such as saliva and semen left behind by someone, the state of forensics at the time left a lot to be desired. Due to the lack of fingerprints, the police were forced to use the old-fashioned methods of canvassing residences and questioning those in the neighborhood who may have heard or seen anything on the night of the murder, or even customers of the prostitute, to see if any leads should shake loose from the tree, so to speak. Still, there was no description of the alleged assailant. To this day, the case remains unsolved and therefore remains open. If forensic techniques had been more advanced at the time, perhaps this would not be the mystery.
Lily Lindstrom had been buried near her home city of Malmo on May 16, 1932. Between the days of August 27, 28, 2011 in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, Tropical Storm Irene dumped increasing amounts of rain and destructive winds to the eastern seaboard of the United States. Two roommates at the time, David Glazer and Edward Frampton, along with their friend Robert Chadwell, were in the roommate's residence waiting out the storm. Frampton had been described as mildly mentally challenged, but remained active in basketball and competed in the Special Olympics. He was also an advocate of people with disabilities where he gave lectures and made presentations to help caregivers understand and meet the needs of the people they were serving. Chadwell was a good friend of both Frampton and Glazer and had proved to be a counselor helping adolescents with drug and alcohol problems before moving back to his hometown of Pittsfield. Glazer was a popular handyman who liked rock music and played the drums. Like Frampton, Glazer suffered from various mental and physical disabilities and had a problem that would put all three men at risk. In 2009, Adam Lee Hall, a high-ranking member of the Massachusetts chapter of the Hells Angels, lured Glazer to his home and then gave the disabled man a beating with a baseball bat because he thought Glazer had stolen a carburetor from him. Glazer, perhaps not understanding the risk to his safety, went to the police. Two days later, the police arrested Hall on not only the assault charge, but on drug and gun charges as well. Hall was due in court to face the charges in September 2011, as Glazer prepared to testify against Hall. After the storm moved on, it was Robert Chadwell's brother, Les, who first began to suspect something was wrong with his brother. The two stayed in nearly daily contact, and when Les couldn't get a hold of Robert, he began to get worried. Around the same time, Aaron Forbush, Frampton's disability caseworker, went to check on him after not hearing from him either. Forbush found no one at home, but Glazer's truck still in the driveway and the television still playing. She also found Frampton's medications, which he took daily, hadn't been touched, and his wallet had been left on his computer stand. Forbush reported the three men as missing to authorities. Knowing that Glazer was in danger because he was going to testify against Hall, the police focused their investigation on him while continuing to search for the other men. Eleven days had passed, and unfortunately, authorities discovered the bodies of Glazer, Frampton, and Chadwell. All of them had been dismembered, wrapped in plastic bags, and buried in a pit. Autopsies later revealed that the three men had been tortured, gutted, and shot to death. The police believed that Glazer was the target and the other two were simply at the wrong place at the wrong time. Through their investigations, police found that Hall had not acted alone. They identified three accomplices who may have murdered the men. David Chalu, who was reportedly a member of the Aryan Brotherhood, and David Casey, a backhoe operator from New York. It was the third accomplice who would take this case from a typical, if gruesome, organized crime-related murder to an international media sensation. The third accomplice charged in the killing of Glazer, Frampton, and Chadwell was Caius Domitius Veovis, a man who claimed to be a vampire and a Satan worshiper. Originally named Roy C. Gutfinsky Jr., he legally changed his name in 2008. In a letter to the media, he said his first and middle names were inspired by the Roman emperors Caligula and Nero, both known for their insanity and depravity. And his last name is from an Etruscan demon, which was not entirely accurate. Veovis changed his appearance with various facial tattoos that contained runic writing across one cheek and to make himself even more sinister, paid for the mark of the beast across his forehead. Veovis also had two rows of subdermal implants in his forehead 
which gave the appearance of horns. He had implants in his ears to make them look pointed. His teeth were sharpened and his tongue split. In his booking photo, he's wearing a large gauge septum piercing and two smaller bridge piercings. His outlandish booking photo became a viral sensation, attracting media coverage from all over the world. Veovis also had an interesting history with law enforcement, with his first arrest when he was 13 for carrying a knife. Later in 1999, he, age 19, and still named Gutfinsky, and his 16-year-old girlfriend were convicted in Maine for assaulting another 16-year-old girl. They lured her to their hotel room, where his girlfriend slashed the girl's back with a razor. The two kissed as they licked up the girl's blood. Their victim would end up needing 32 stitches to close her wound. Veova served seven and a half years of a 10-year sentence for that crime. Then, in 2006, while he was still on parole, he was charged with kidnapping two strippers from a nightclub and holding them against their will in a hotel room. Authorities later dropped the charges, but sent Veovis back to prison for violating his parole. Veovis's accomplices stood trial, and Hall and Shalu were both convicted of three counts of murder, three counts of kidnapping, and three counts of intimidation of a witness. Both were given life sentences. Casey, who reportedly helped bury the bodies with a backhoe, pled guilty to three counts of accessory after the fact of murder, kidnapping, and intimidation of a witness. In exchange for his testimony against Hall and Shalu, he was sentenced to time served. Veovis's trial began in September of 2014. He pled not guilty on all counts, and according to experienced trial observers at the time, there was no physical evidence linking him to the victims or the crime. In fact, none of the weapons used were ever found. All of the witnesses for the prosecution in Hall and Shalu's cases had testified that Veovis was not present at any of the incriminating events. In fact, Veovis's current girlfriend gave him an alibi for the night of the murders. And unlike Hall and Shalu, Veovis didn't belong to either the Aryan Brotherhood or the Hells Angels. He didn't even own a motorcycle. The prosecution, nonetheless, produced testimony that Hall considered Veovis a prospect for the Hells Angels. Witnesses did, however, state that the three were seen together the night before the murders. There was also evidence of blood in Veovis's car, though it couldn't be proven to be any of the victims. Other evidence introduced in the trial included knives, machetes, and diagrams of human dissections found in Veovis's apartment. Evidence. The prosecution claimed that he really enjoyed torturing them and cutting them up. Finally, the jury received the case and deliberated for 37 hours over six days before delivering a guilty verdict. When they read their verdict to the court, Veovis yelled, I'll see you all in hell. Remember that, every one of you. I'll see you all in hell. Under Massachusetts law, he was given the mandatory sentence of life in prison with no chance for parole. At his sentencing, he continued to proclaim his innocence, quoting, Let me make this clear. My hand wasn't in this, he said. He appealed his case to the state Supreme Court in 2017, but his conviction was upheld. Veovis is currently serving his sentence at the North Central Correctional Institution in Gardner, Massachusetts. Whether one believes in the blood is the life or not, it became readily apparent that all three of these cases demonstrated the zealotrous devotion of the main characters that we covered in our stories in this episode. Silas Wilcox professed that blood could heal the sick, no matter who needed to be sacrificed. The Atlas Vampire, although he or she may have committed murders before or since, the details of any of those murders have been lost to history. However, it does remain one of the most bizarre cases in criminal history. And finally, Caius Domitius Veovis. No matter how one dresses up this case, Veovis displayed the characteristics of assailants both before and after the crimes he committed, even with his slightly less than unique signatures. Let us hope that a psychopath of this nature stays incarcerated. 
However, with the present laws and district attorneys who seem to kick the can down the road, this predicament may change. I wanted to let our new subscribers know that we are on PayPal and we are on Facebook and Twitter. I'll leave the links below if you'd like to contribute to the channel. Also, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the two books again, Dark Bayou, Infamous Louisiana Homicides, and Bloodstained Louisiana, 12 Murder Cases, 1896-1934. to 1934. And I'd like to thank you for being here because today is my birthday. We're going to have some new episodes coming up after the first of the year, and I hope that you'll stay with us and tell your friends about us. Uh, it's been a truly great run. We're still going to go, of course. We're going to have more scripts and more episodes coming after the first of the year. Also, if there are any subscribers out there who would like to narrate an episode, I'd like one that could guest host as well. Uh, if you'd like to narrate an episode, please contact me at the address below, truecrimemdi at gmail.com. I'll send you a script. You can uh, send it back to me. You don't have to be a professional, okay? You don't have to be a professional. Again, See you next year. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Until next time.